expectation, witnessing awareness. Again, this state um, of Durya is it's described, um, you know, in the Upanishads of just being, resting in awareness. And um, when we do that, the primary tool again is meditation. But anytime you can just be present and witness, um, even in the midst of some chaos, if you can just step back and be the witness of what's happening, that's a state of restful awareness. Your physiology completely shifts. And we've done studies, and many people have done studies. We've done some studies at the center that looks at the system, the genes, the electrical activity, the electromagnetic you know, um, activity around the body of what happens when we just shift into awareness. And the physiology will completely change. Um, we feel more peace in the body rather than turbulence. So again, the same thing can happen to us, the same conversation that somebody had with us, but we feel peace in the body. So what happens? We don't react to that feeling, that emotion that we used to react to. We can come from this place of consciousness and awareness. And we realize, again, that we have free will. We don't have to be um, just conditioned by our past behaviors and, and feel victims to everything that happens to us in our lives. So to me, it's very empowering. You know, I, it sometimes is a little difficult conversation to start to have with people, but when you frame it as this is really empowering, then um, you know, people start to want to look at their emotional experiences. Um, okay, go ahead. And when we're in restful awareness, you can see here, the slide just shows that our physiology actually completely shifts, as I just mentioned. The immune system is better, blood pressure comes down, we actually start to make more rejuvenative hormones from the adrenal glands and other hormones in the body. And again, um, this is when we're emotionally also at peace. Um, and again, because stress response are the seeds of illness, we actually can prevent chronic illness from meditation. And again, working as part of that, working through that emotional stress that happens in our life. Um, again, this is just that fight or flight, what things look like, restful awareness. And again, this has been very validated with um, studies and science over and over again, reproduced, not just one study or a couple. Like for the last several decades, people have been looking at this. So we want to come from a place of restful awareness. And then what happens when we do that? So at the center, we sort of, we, we describe kind of this evolution of what happens once we get out of those stuck ways of dealing with things. Restful awareness is really the gateway to these higher levels of awareness. And again, they do have spiritual correlates as well. The intuitive response, we start to observe our emotions, like I was saying. We have that little bit of space, and we become more in tune to what's happening in our body. We can witness the sensations in our body and then we can authentically express ourselves so when we can become more in tuned intuitive response is like really checking in with ourselves and we can start to come from a more conscious place of communicating what we're feeling in our relationships and our jobs etc okay next slide um, this, don't worry about this, it's just to make, help me remind, uh, remember to talk about yoga, which we'll talk about in the tools section, but yoga is one of, you know, and again, sometimes like we hear, and I remember as a child, you know, I, we had these yellowing books of yogis and all these weird positions and in loin class, and it was like kind of interesting and cool, and I knew there was like yoga, and you know, I learned to meditate at a very young age, and we thought of it as prayer. Um, and then we kind of ate Ayurvedically, you know, just the way my mom cooked. But I didn't really ever understand how it all fit together, um, again, until, like, I started learning about it in this new way. And yoga is actually one of the best ways to improve your interoception, again, is a word we use in, in science, to describe what happens when you start doing yoga. You start to hear the signals from your body much better. And it's an actual phenomenon. You know, the, the signals and the nerve endings from your body start to communicate better back to your brain and your heart, and everything starts to work in more sync. So yoga is actually a wonderful practice and a tool that I use in my life very regularly. Um, and it optimizes our self-regulation, not just of our body, but of our emotions. Okay, next slide. And again, each of the things I'm talking about could really be a whole conversation in and of itself. It's really fascinating and wonderful with all of the validation and scientific validation that we have about all of these practices. So, you know, I'm just going to introduce um, this idea of conscious communication. At the center, we use, again, some Western psychology. Um, sometimes, 
in the spiritual context, you know, we can give, and I really, it really depends on the person I'm sitting in front of. Sometimes the spiritual messages really resonate with someone. Sometimes it's more of a Western psychology approach. Either way, you know, the cognitive behavioral therapy you hear about, like, you know, um, working with your thoughts, it's, it's just self-examination, you know, self, um, self-inquiry. It's, it's like, um, you know, many of the tools we use in the spiritual practices, but sometimes framing it in a little bit more modern way can help people. So this is where we start to consciously communicate what happened as a witness, you know, that observation. Um, you know, and again, we, with Marshall Rosenberg, who wrote about um, how to consciously communicate, he really tries to get us to move out of that victim mode. And I like to think of that as out of ego mind. You know, my boss disrespects me. He doesn't respect me. That's more of a little bit of a victim mode. Um, you know, what emotions are rising in me? I'm feeling, you know, hurt or I'm feeling, you know, underappreciated. What do I need that I'm not receiving? So we kind of work through this with people and actually help, help write this down. Um, because if, and what am I asking for? Have you asked to have your needs met in your job, in your relationship? You know, sometimes we just expect people to show up with these, you know, here's your raise, or, you know, hey, can I take the laundry out or take the garbage out for you? Um, and, you know, sure, that would be great if people could read our minds and know what we need. But a conscious being understands we have to communicate. Um, people don't read our minds. Um, well, some people might, if they're, you know, but um, so what am I asking for? And consciously communicating that instead of coming from a place of anger and resentment, you never do anything for me or, you know, you know, talking to your boss, you don't appreciate me. Um, you know, we can start again as we start to witness and, you know, go through some of these practices. Um, you know, I really feel that I've been here for a while and, um, you know, I haven't gotten a raise. I would like to, you know, show that you value me by, you know, potentially, having, you know, again, we can play through different scenarios of conversation. And then perhaps a, a more conscious communication opens up. Well, you know, we really don't have the budget for this right now. And then as we start to get into more creative responses, then maybe we can come up with new ideas or creative solutions. Well, okay, I understand that if we don't have a budget, how about if I get one more extra day off every quarter or two or whatever, you know? So we start to, instead of just being stuck in this kind of victim mode, nobody appreciates me, believe me, I've been there. So I'm talking from experience as well, um, that we can start to move into more consciously communicating. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, so again, what happened from a witness perspective, not from an ego mind perspective or a victim? Um, what emotions are arising in me? And trying to really identify so in it, with empowering words. And he has an excellent book, Marshall Rosenberg does, that helps us to communicate with ourselves first so that we can communicate with the next person consciously about what it is that we're really feeling. Um, and the words we use to describe how we feel actually create our reality. So if we're using words that put us in the victim mode, then we stay the victim to everything that's happening to us. If we start to use language that's more empowering, where we can actually do something with our emotions, then we don't feel so out of control of everything that's happening in our life. Okay, next slide. So a couple, you can put the bullet points up there. Again, what do I need that I'm not getting or that I'm fearful of? maybe not being appreciated, maybe not being accepted. And again, the more, the higher we get in our spiritual practice, the more we're getting those needs met internally. So as you proceed in a spiritual um, journey and you start to get everything you need, because the more we connect with consciousness, we get all of our needs met, in, met internally. Then you also find you don't need these things, again, externally as much. Um, and then uh, the last thing is, what am I asking for? So we want to ask in a way that, you know, doesn't trigger the other person's buttons, perhaps. Okay. So then again, what happens as we start to evolve, as I mentioned, you know, from my meditation practices and witnessing and some of the tools that we're going to talk about in the second half, um, we start to come up with creative responses. So again, maybe you go home and you contemplate, you know, you just sit with it and then you come back a week later and again, you ask your boss, well, could I just have a, maybe, you, you know, I have a couple more days off every quarter. And then, you know, you work out a solution or in relationship, um, you know, where can we compromise and come up with creative solutions? And again, when we're clogged, our emotional body, our mind in the same ways of conditioned thinking, no creative thoughts can come in. So this is where we just see the same thing happen over and over and over in our lives with our relationships. 
ultimately what starts to happen is we start to live from the collective consciousness or collective soul. And many psychiatrists um, have talked about the collective soul in um, the, you know, Vedic and um, Vedanta and that philosophy. We're looking at our archetypes, our deities, our you know, devotional practices, who, what qualities, and even in Greek mythology and, and even in um, you know, some media and entertainment, you know, of the great epic stories, Star Wars and you know, some of these great epic stories are really just mythology. So each of the characters are representing some qualities of the universe. And which characters do we want to embody, right? So when we start to look at our deities, when even like we, um, if for those of you that were at um, Swami's talk on uh, the pictures of Sri Ramakrishna, like when we start to look at these images, we start to embody the qualities. And so we can use our devotional practice um, or even just um, again asking ourselves what like you know what I want what qualities do I want to increase in my life compassion loving compassion nonviolence you know these are some of my um, archetypes we say so at the center we work sometimes with archetypes what are the qualities you want to bring in I talked to someone recently who um, he's from India and his dad is uh, he's from South India he's a police officer and has been his whole life and he said he worshipped Hanuman and he just would have that image and he would worship Hanuman and you know because of the strength and you know that protective sort of um, archetype and um, he said you know he, I think he started looking like him too <laughs> you know <laughs> so like you know again when we plant intentions and we use imagery and we look at our um, you know Murthy's and our uh, in, I, you know pictures we start to embody and actually in some you know it's very interesting in some of the science we we have a lot of control over our genes not the genes we got, we got what we got, but which ones are turned on and off. So we can actually change our physical body based on our thoughts and our, um, you know, intentions. So again, these are this is where we go into intention setting. What stories would I like to enact? What qualities would I like to have in my life? And then you can set intentions. You know, and maybe you create an altar with some image that embodies that. And then ultimately. Ultimately, our goal is to get to this sacred response. Sense of self expands way beyond a constricted form of ego. You know, this is I, 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 as an ego becomes the bigger I. Um, and again, in Vedanta, we talk, who am I? Who is the I? The I is really consciousness, but we're identifying with the individual ego I. So ultimately, as we progress, again, along our spiritual practice, and people who are enlightened beings who have reached samadhi, come from sacred response. Immediately, instead of having to go through the process of witnessing our emotions and stuff, which you know, most of us have to do, ultimately we get to a place where we transcend all of that, and instead of saying, you know, what need didn't I get met, or what do I need, we start to say, how can I serve? And again, this is like the ultimate evolution. We may not get there in this lifetime. This is what some texts would say, turiyata, meaning um, in every moment. So in Thuria, in restful awareness, we are still and we're quiet and we're experiencing consciousness. In this state, whether we're waking, dreaming, deep sleep, you know, all of the other levels of awareness, we're witnessing, we're, we're coming, we're observing as consciousness everything that happens in our life, in every moment, and even in our waking state. So um, this is, again, enlightened beings. They're coming from that state, and you can just tell when you look at them, right, that they're coming from a, a place from consciousness. Compassion and empathy become our natural expression. So we don't even go into those emotions anymore. We just by bypass all of that, transcend, and go into compassion, and how can I serve? Um, and we really understand that each of us is just we're all just different manifestations of consciousness. There is no me, there's no you, we're all just one, and we're these individual waves that are all part of this bigger ocean of consciousness. And um, I'll, I'll tell you a little story that I heard that really um, sort of epitomizes the sacred response. Um, so of course from India there's all kinds of wonderful folk stories and tales um, because it's very interesting I find in um, Indian storytelling there's a, a lot of, um, you, you learn a lot about a society and a culture based on their uh, stories, right? So in India the, the stories that are passed on and told are, are about enlightened beings, you know, these enlightened people that just lived as normal humans but they were enlightened. 
um, and there are stories created around that. And you know, in Amer and there's no good or bad, but of course in America, like when I thought back, you know, in my sort of self reflections. Um, you know, we really, a lot of our stories and folklore is about like Paul Bunyan and Daniel Boone and people who were very independent and kind of conquered the wilderness and, you know, like were strong. And, you know, those are sort of qualities that we really sort of, um, you know, uh, enjoy or, you know, that sort of were part of the founding, you know, qualities of this country. Um, and again, those are all important qualities. Um, however, you know, it's, I love Indian stories because they're always about enlightened beings, right? So one of the stories I heard was, uh, I believe his name was Yamdas, and maybe you can correct me if some of you, if you know, but um, there's a lot of stories around him. He was an enlightened man who lived just in a regular town, village, you know, and he was outside. So he was living from this response. So this is what it would look like um, when this happens. I'm still waiting, but, you know, I might get there someday. Um, he was outside of his home, and uh, he had his little stove, you know, he had his simple sort of dwelling, and he was making his chapati and kind of flipping it on his little fire. And another person, another man, ran by him and took, stole the chapati off his, um, you know, little thing and ran off with it. And he immediately, Namdas immediately gets up and runs, starts running after him. And he's saying, come back, come back, come back. And, you know, the thief is running off. No, this is my chapati. And um, so someone in the village stops him. He says, Namdas, why are you chasing him? You know, like, because you're supposed to be this enlightened being, right? So they said, you know, why are you chasing him going after a chapati? He said, oh, I don't want the chapati, but if he's going to have the chapati, I want him to have ghee with it because it's so much tastier. It's so much better with ghee. So I want to get him so that he can enjoy it to the fullest because if, you know, he's me. And if I'm going to have the chapati, I want to have it with ghee. So, you know, he wasn't thinking like, oh, that person took my chapati and um, I want it back. He was saying, how can I serve and how can I um, help this individual have, you know, the best experience, you know, that they can have. So, again, um, you know, we strive for these things. And maybe in moments in our lives we have these experiences. And we know we feel so expansive when we come from these higher levels of awareness. Um, and, you know, again, I, I think I would probably think most of us would agree that, you know, yeah, it would be great to feel expansive and come from that those places, even if it's, you know, visionary and, you know, co connecting to these big archetypes or creative response, but maybe not so much stuck in that fight or flight all the time. Um, and the next slide. So again, I'll just um, close before we go into the next section. We'll take a little break, but this really ties back again into Vedic Vedanta, like that, you know, everything is really the Leela, the play, right? We're all just actors in this big play. And when we, uh, my kids were in drama, that was their, um, they're 22 and 19 now, but um, when they were in high school, they were in drama. And I would, I would have these sort of really enlightening moments when I would watch them on the stage and see how they would go through their experience. Because when they were in it, they were it. Whatever their character was, like they would play it really well. But, you know, in the back of your mind, you know you're not really that character. You know, you're just playing a role. And then, you know, when at the end of a show, we would call it the strike, we would break, and they would do it right here in Balboa Park, you know, at the San Diego Junior Theater. Beautiful shows. If any of you have a chance, you should go watch them. Um, because it is a, it's a metaphor for our lives, right? So on the last show, we would have this big dinner, and all the girls would cry because the show was over, and I loved playing that role, and now it's done. So you grieve. It's fine. You, you say, you know, I'm, I'm really sad that that role is over, and you grieve it. And then the very next day, they're like, okay, now what can I audition for next? What's my next role? So they would get an excitement about their next role. And again, I reflected on that for quite a while, that really that I would, I, I, I try to think about that, you know, like again, in the back of your mind, as you're watching yourself be this character, recognizing we're really just consciousness, and this is just a character that I'm playing, right? In this field, of this stage, this Leela, this play, it's all just Maya anyway. But when we're in the role, we want to play it well, right? So that would be like an actor not really fully playing their role well. Um, but yet also knowing when that role is done, I don't have that job anymore. I'm not in that relationship anymore. And I defined myself. You know, imagine what the kids would, you know, if they defined themselves as that character they were playing, like you couldn't function that way, right, when the role's over. So, um, you know, just to identify that everything we're doing in the roles that we're playing as part of this field of uh, this play of consciousness. 
And ultimately, we want to understand ourselves as this eternal witness. Ultimately, our goal, our real dharma, our real purpose is to know ourselves as consciousness, to know ourselves as God. And um, when we do that more and more and more in our lives, then, um, again, we experience more of the qualities of consciousness, which is peace, harmony, love, compassion, forgiveness, um, and expansion. Um, and it's a much more comfortable place to be, I would say. So, um, so our, I think we're going to have a little break. That kind of sets up, you know, sort of emotions and emotional body and, and, and a kind of a different way of thinking about things, perhaps. And then um, with the second half, we'll talk about tools, which is one of my favorite things to talk about because this is the practical part of it. How can we shift these emotions, and what tools do we have to do that? Um, do we should we add, do questions at the end or like? Well, I think that'd be good. Why don't at the, at the end, then. Okay. Yeah. No. All right. Mm -hmm. Is this your house? No, it belongs to the Dante. Yeah, the Dante bought it. So I'd just like to uh, have a, just a show of hands. We're trying something new to sort of like. Um, we are we're not very good at promoting. We're not very good at marketing. We don't do any of this. We say, if, if it's the Lord's will, then people come. But we, I have a question. How many people have come here because of Meetup? That's the one thing we're doing. Just one. Anybody else see us in Meetup? And that's why you came? There's a, it's, a, it's a thing that we uh, signed up for. Okay. And for those first timers, how did you hear about this? Through a friend. Through a friend? Through a website. Well, you're not a first time. Yeah, right. Okay. Anybody else? First time? How did they hear about this? From my friend. From your friend. Okay. All right. That's good. Okay, that's good. That's, uh, we're very privileged, I have to say. Usually, um, they speak at the Chopra Center, and it's... Uh, how many people have gone to the Chopra Center? Uh, wow, look at that. So many people. Okay, so you know how privileged we are to have her here today, oh, yeah. sure. speaking. So. I'm so privileged to be here, Swami. <laughs> <laughs> so, I do, let me interject one other thing, is that um, um, after she finishes, um, we have another event that's occurring, and it's through the Interreligious Council. Um, we're part of the IRC, Interreligious Council, where there's about eight different faiths that get together every month, and we talk about spiritual topics. So the program that's going on today is at the Buddhist temple in downtown. It's the first Buddhist temple that was uh, created in San Diego. And it's a big traditional Buddhist temple in downtown San Diego. And we were doing an interreligious cafe. And what that means is the Buddhist monk is going to speak there. Not the monk, the Buddhist, um, the, um, uh, the person he's going to speak. The he's lama. And he's not the lama. No. He's actually, in, in that one, they can actually get married. So it's not a monk. He's the Buddhist teacher in that, uh, in that, in that temple. He's going to speak about how to ba balancing one's life, how to find balance. And so he'll speak for about 20 minutes. And then a spiritual cafe means you actually have coffee, tea, snacks, and you get into groups. And then there's going to be questions. And the questions are going to pertain to about how, to, how, to, how do you balance your lifestyle. And each one, each person will have a chance to answer those questions in like two or three minutes. And you go around the table and answer these questions. And someone writes all your answers and then just presents them in, to the bigger group. So if this is something that you'd like to do. It's at the uh, Buddhist temple. There's a flyer in the back with the address. It's going to be from 3.30 to 5 o'clock. And in that type of uh, um, form, you have people from different types of faith. So the nice thing is you're getting... You're hearing about, uh, it's a chance to meet people from Buddhist, Jewish, Islamic, different, different faiths, and to see what they say about these different topics. We've had topics from when people pass away, dealing with death. What was the last one about? The last one was um, Relationship. relationships. <laughs> Discrimination. And so, so this one is about how to find balance in your lives. Okay? And that, again, is uh, this today at 3.30 at the Buddhist Temple in San Diego. I'm sorry, actually 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock. Okay. Now we'd like to continue on with Dr. Patel's. And... Um